Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne One for BeatStars.com. Here, doing something I've never done before, which is interview two producers at the same time. I honestly don't know why A pushed for, for both of them to be interviewed at the same time, but I think it has something to do with them both using the, the letter X to replace the letter O in their names. Is that mm -hmm. fair to say? Yeah. It's pretty absolutely. fair. Okay, but also because of some like Instagram trolling that was going on, that Ghost is apparently an Instagram troll? Yeah, I just leave comments on Cody's stuff, and that's somehow how <laughs> this happened. Yeah. Okay, so for any technical difficulties with, with the multiple um, uh, video, that's all That's all uh, Ghost's fault. Yeah. <laughs> just to start things off, I, I love interviewing people who aren't producers, who aren't necessarily the most connected in the industry, just because you give really honest answers. A couple months ago, and I don't know if, if, if the two of you were a part of this conversation, but a couple months ago on Twitter, there was this really interesting moment that happened, which was a bunch of, and I think it was specifically BeatStars users, started posting screenshots of their monthly earnings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a pushback to a lot of the criticism that internet producers were getting. The, the stigma is that you can't make any real money selling beats online you you know you sell five beats for 99 cents how are you making any money and then there were these screenshots that proved producers were making ten thousand a month twelve thousand fifteen thousand a month and i and i interviewed taylor king uh recently who's a very successful uh producer who sells almost exclusively on the internet and he told me his yeah. biggest month was twenty thousand he's talented too i love all this stuff unique but yeah definitely absolutely so did, yeah. you, did were you part of that conversation where you were posting the the monthly earnings? Uh, I wasn't. No, I wasn't part of it. But I think I posted something last month um, in relation to uh, what producing online's allowed me to do. Like I just bought a new car. It was, it's a luxury car. It's a '68 Camaro, and that's like all I do is make music. So I'm doing it in the bedroom right now I'm in the office. Yeah, and it's not this super glamorous studio with with plaques everywhere and super cool lighting and leather everything right nah i got a uh i got a hand-me-down desk from uh from uh one of my mom's old offices they were just throwing out desk i got a desk I about like 20 packs of stickers made my own desk i got these rocket uh krk rocket uh speakers and i use them literally to listen to music i don't even make music with them I make music with these right here so you only got you those speakers like two months ago right yeah, they're pretty new, but I just use them when I'm BSing, playing games or something. I don't even use them to produce. I'm so used to producing on these for the last three years, so I got the hang of it. I like what I like. So So for the last three years, you were using earpods or, or whatever those are called nowadays. Yes, I still do. If it sounds good in the headphones, it usually sounds good. I mean, I know where the frequency should be on all the sounds and stuff, so it's kind of muscle memory by now. All right, Ghost, how about you? What, what kind of monitors are you working with right now? I have HS8s. I have like way more. I have a pretty traditional setup. I have like all logic based. I use Apogee Duet 2 interface and HS8s, but that's it. I just got a, a Advanced 49 last year for my MIDI keyboard, which I like don't use at all. And I have this uh, boutique tube mic that I use from a company called Stellar for like when I sample myself, and that's it, just in my bedroom. What what DAW are you using? You're on a Mac platform. Logic. I, I use Logic Pro. Logic and, and Cody, what are you using? FL. I, I was having a conversation before you got on, Cody, with, with Ghost um, uh -huh. regarding the whole shift from making money as a producer selling beats to the general public to making money as a producer uh, in the what's called the traditional music industry. So placements, labels, that kind of thing. Yeah. Congratulations on purchasing the car. Is is that and I, re, I did that last year, too. I actually made the most money I ever made in my whole music career last year. And I didn't have a, okay, I had one major placement, but it was with an artist that, that we signed a joint deal with. So it didn't feel like a major placement because it's a kid I've known all my life. Yeah. yeah. So with you, did you have major placements that, that led up to that income or that was all internet? 99% internet. Um, <clears throat> I did something with Twista. Um, me and his manager are still in touch, but I think that was my first year that I finally had something. I don't even think the track ever went out. He recorded it and sent it to me. But uh, that was the first uh you know, placement contract I ever signed. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's um, I've had a few placements here and there. Nothing crazy though. But most ninety nine percent of my income has been from online YouTube and my personal website. So just to be t totally clear, without major label placements, you were making a living for yourself. That's comfortable for you. Oh, absolutely. Last year was the the first year I was uh, towards the middle of last year, like the, the, the last six months of 2017, I changed my prices and I ended the year out almost at six figures. And this year, um, I'm already just about there. 
I'll be there by the end of the month, and it's uh, we're in June. Yeah, so we're six months into the year, so that's. I'm, I've been producing three years, so second year I was making a a, a good living, yeah. and then this year it's picking up even more. You know what? Let's let's just talk about that really quickly because three years isn't isn't that long to. No, yeah you know make six figures what what would you say is a part of your overall strategy a part of your overall work ethic that has led to you creating that loyal of a, of a customer base where you're able to, to generate that amount of income i think um really i just adopted the keep it simple stupid method um i'm super consistent i don't change stuff up much you know i got my formula and i and i I try to. I always try to be unique with my music, but I don't. I don't do anything that strays too much from as far as a business model goes. You know, I release. Uh, I haven't missed a, a week of uploading. Seven days hasn't gone by without me uploading in three years. I, some days, uh, some weeks, I upload two or three, but I make sure that no matter what I do, I always have something to upload. I'm always connecting with people. I think it's really huge as far as for me keeping a a client base that I'm super open to talking to my customers. I always try to keep them satisfied. If anything ever happens where a uh, beat gets delivered late or something or or there's a mix-up or something, I always compensate rappers for that. So I always try to you know make them want to work with me. Towards the middle of last year, like the, the, the last six months of 2017, I changed my prices. And I ended the year out almost at six figures. And this year, um, I'm already just about there. I'll be there by the end of the month, and it's uh, we're in June. So, so is that a result of a lot of deliberate marketing, such as you know using an ads platform like AdWords or Facebook, or is a lot of that organically built based off of YouTube? I think I used AdWords for like two months, my first year producing, like literally coming up from zero subscribers. Um, I haven't used AdWords or anything like that, any type of of paid marketing like that, and uh. In, in two years, a little more, a little over two years now. So everything's all organic reaching out. Now now it's kind of the point where the ball's rolling on its own and I kind of have a name for myself. Um, so I don't have to market as much as I had to. I was always trying to connect. Uh, Mackenzie knows, I think I had like a thousand subscribers when I first reached out to Mackenzie. Yeah. And one thing I would say for producers is if they're going to reach out, don't make it seem like spam. Because when I would, when I, you know, our relationship now, Mackenzie is pretty good. We're good friends. Um, when I, when I reached out to you, it was very personal. Hey, I really loved what you did at the minute thirty mark here. You know, I would love to work with you. I've been following you for a long time since this track in two thousand sixteen or something like yeah. that. So I don't reach out. Um, hey, dope beat. Uh, check out my channel if you get a chance. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I actually showed a genuine interest in what they're doing, and I think that's what helped me at first. Instead of rappers being the people to subscribe to me first and start helping me, I think it was being cool with the producers in the community and, and feeding off of each other and learning marketing schemes and stuff. Uh, okay, Ghost, um, do you have a, a similar experience? How long have you been making beats and, and when did uh, it start making a, an actual living for you? I actually, I got really lucky with the whole scenario. I didn't start listening. I'm actually super like uninformed about rap and hip-hop, to be perfectly honest. Like I didn't start listening to any of that genre at all till like 2014. Like after I stopped playing in hardcore bands and stuff, which is like all I did as a kid. And uh, it only, I made my first beat like in the middle of 2014. And it, it took me like eight or nine months to make it a full time job, which was dope. I mean, like unbelievable. I think I benefited off like YouTube being a little bit more organic back then. I put up a few beats probably super early uh, 2015 that we're getting like a thousand or two thousand views a day which it was insane back then like it was totally wild for me and that led to so many sales it was unbelievable like the conversion rate was so crazy back then and yeah, yeah so by the, by the time it was like may or june in 2015 i think i started in like july or august of 2014 by the time it was like may or june the next year i had i had already started moving out of my my current job which was uh audio technician at cbs news in manhattan and i was making it a full-time thing so I don't know. I got super lucky with the internet, and I have to like thank YouTube for that. And I Absolutely. think what Cody said about establishing like a, a baseline of producer friends at the beginning was huge. Like, you know, I wasn't on BeatStars yet. wasn't on I wasn't on uh, any other beat sales platforms until the end of 2015. So it was just like all email beats. You know, I didn't even realize people would want to buy them at the beginning. But then it was just like 
you get a few that are interested, you sort of let the model develop on its own. And five months later, you know, you have a number that you need to make every day and then you can quit your job. Like it was easy. How, how do the two of you stay connected with your customers that have already purchased Beats and keep them coming back, keep them satisfied? I think at the beginning it was nothing so intentional as like any sort of lists or or email marketing or anything like that. It was just the community was so small on YouTube that people just got back to you every time you posted a beat and you always knew that the person who had bought it previously was going to see it. Then as it started to grow, it got more difficult and more difficult. And once YouTube got more saturated and channel and having a channel with 5,000 subscribers was nothing, you know, maybe in middle middle of 2016 when it started going crazy, yeah. uh, I needed to start relying on like beats. Like when I, once I was on BeatStars, I needed to start relying on like actual, you know, data and stuff like that to... Uh, reach out to people again or like just email organization folders of you know like starring starring a folder or starring an email with someone who's who's purchased something or is going to purchase something and just having that in your background but i never really did too much marketing at all like i was never been i've never been that good at like going for the sale you know what i mean i think i've been extremely lucky for like my the pace at which i put out beats and the pace at which i write and the little marketing I do, I think I've been really lucky to make it a full time gig. But so I'm not the I'm definitely not the best example for like how to market as an online producer. But I am an example of like if you put out interesting material and like put the work in and like try to make something fresh, like people are gonna reward you a hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that uh, at least in my case, I try to stay connected to because uh, I started, I didn't know what I was. Doing it at all. I had no connection at all to the music industry, making music. I got injured playing uh, college football, and uh, I was in a wheelchair for a little over a month, so I was going crazy, so I downloaded FL Studio. And when I was coming up, I would always make sure I would stay connected to the people who always commented. You you know, you have those people who always comment on your videos and stuff, or reach out to you, let you know, hey, that was a dope beat. Even if it's every week, I always make it a point to, to say I appreciate them and stuff. So I think more so behind the beat itself, because my music obviously speaks for itself, but staying connected with the, the people that you know, like your stuff, and giving back to them and being having a personal relationship with them helps a lot too. Even if it's just a, a word or two of Thank you, or I appreciate your support. That goes a long way. When I was at South by with uh, Cash Money AP, and he was explaining his whole uh, rise to internet producer mega stardom, he and now yeah. and now you know music industry mega stardom. Um, he said that he would sure. reply to every single comment that his his subscribers left Absolutely. on his YouTube. Video. Absolutely. And you think, well, yeah. damn, that's a lot of work. He also said he didn't have a social life for, for a good two years. He, he still might not. I don't know. He, he should be playing pro basketball. He's so damn tall. But what else was interesting is that both of you have really unique styles. I mean, I know when I, when I listen to a Cody beat, it's going to be this hard, gritty sample with very current-sounding, energetic drums. I know when I listen to a ghost beat, it's going to be this ethereal, sonic environment that just sounds you know, spaced out and wavy. And Absolutely. when I interviewed Bubba Got Beats and he was talking about his, his successes as a, as a producer, he said that the second he strays away from what he's known for, his, his engagement drops and his sales drop, and it sounds like you've experienced the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of it, I mean, especially when we started, there was no, no rule book or play-by-play -play of how you should do certain things. So a lot of it was teaching yourself and luckily, the trial and error phase is kind of over, and I know it works, and I know what keywords to use, and I know what type of beats people are looking for, because every time I make a, like you said, what you know me for, every time I upload a beat like that, it always gets better engagement than if I do something that strays off of what my, I usually do. So something else I've been trying to work on is, actually me and Mackenzie together, is we're making a lot of beats that we think maybe aren't on our typical style, and we're putting them together. Yeah. We're not we're not uploading them on YouTube, but we're sending them out together as a pack. Since you know me and Mackenzie have a really good uh, you know friendship and business relationship, we're comfortable with doing that. And I think if we combine, you know, he has a unique exactly how you said, and mm -hmm. I have a unique style. That if we bring it together and, and reach out is another good way for us to use 
our style and maybe stray a little bit away because you know I don't always want to make the, the the stuff I make as far as I want to put out other stuff or I want to show other people what I can do and maybe not playing with my YouTube my YouTube platform is a way to do it maybe reaching out another way is another way for me to get different type of sound out and then leaving my YouTube for what people come there for. So I know what my audience is. I know what they yeah. like and I don't play with it too much because they, they know why they come to my channel. So if they're yeah, looking so for that let, hard beat with the sample, they're coming mm -hmm. to my channel and I don't want to, I don't want to mess with that. Yeah. You want to keep your, you're keeping your YouTube consistent while you make inroads elsewhere with your other stuff. Exactly. Style. Yeah. I think that's fair. So, what, yeah. so let's, let's say you're, you're starting off right now from scratch. Um, mm -hmm. As a brand new producer, you know, you're talented, you know what you know in terms of mm -hmm. how to make the beats, you're just not sure mm -hmm. how, how to market them, but you're starting from zero. What what would you do right now to get started and get a foothold in the game as it is currently? To try and get a foothold in the game, and some I've only talked to my boys about, We have a, I have a Discord with uh, a handful of producers, but I don't really talk about it much, I guess you're gonna, everybody's going to hear it now. If I was starting out from the beginning, I'd play around with, with keywords. Maybe I'd put out a uh, Absol type beat. And usually people, if they're consistent and they upload, one beat is going to catch a keyword where you're going to be the number one search for that and you're going to get a couple hundred thousand views. Once you find that keyword that works for you, you need to keep using it and abuse it and make that yours so, so you dominate that search. And that's something I know for a fact. If I started over, I would be able to get to the same place I am, starting from scratch, using those 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 keywords and 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 that type of marketing scheme. So you would you would hop in with you'd play around a little bit with a couple words and then find one and stick with it. And try to yeah. Own it. If if my music spoke for if itself it already, you know sure. what, you know what I mean. If yeah, you, if you already if you, had the if, skills. Like DJ Payne said, if the town is there then it's more about the marketing side. And, yeah. and that's what I would do. If it was strictly, I need to figure out a way to market properly, that's what I would do. I have no idea what I'd do. <laughs> I think it's, I think, Payne, I think you're talking to like, and not to be like overly modest or whatever, but I think you're talking to like a dead YouTube channel and a super duper alive YouTube channel like Cody's. Like we have totally different schemes going on right now. So if I, if I were to, if I were to hop in right now, I might switch up everything. Like, I think I'd still be on YouTube, but I'm I'm not 100% sure about that, you know? Like, just because I don't think I have that consistency that Cody has in terms of, like, what I make or even, like, if I'm able to put out the numbers, like, how many beats a week, how many beats a month or whatever. Like, I've never, ever been able to keep it up. I'll go, like, a whole month without writing a beat just because I feel, like, not good about it or something like that. So... His model is not the same as mine. So if I were to hop in right now with these exact skills that I have, I don't. I don't think I could. I don't think I could be where I am. Because I think the only reason I survived at the beginning was because YouTube was a different animal back then. If you know what I mean. Not Definitely. to be too pessimistic about it, but I don't know. I don't know if my model is like would work on YouTube today. That's too pressing, man. Dude, I know, but like, <laughs> yo, I I write like. It takes me how long to make a beat? It takes me so damn long to make a beat. It's so difficult to like top a keyword now. It's impossible. Like when when I when we were really starting to get going in 2016 and probably late 2015, I'd only been producing for like a year or like nine, ten months. You could like write a dope beat, mm -hmm. and if it got and actually the the stats would be like you know 20 views a day for a month, and then randomly. It would be like, oh, 100 views a day, 300 views a day. And all of a sudden, you're at 2,000 views a day, like three months after you put the beat out. There was like hope. There was hope for the video in the future. But now, if you don't get 10,000 views first day, your video is dead 100% by day five. So it's just a whole different beast. And I don't really have that consistency with like the styles to really nail a keyword. And that's just the, name. That's just the, the way that it goes on YouTube. I think that since the algorithm changed, you know the algorithm changed, Kenzie. On I mean, on in YouTube. theory, like in theory, mm -hmm. yeah, everybody talks about how they know that the algorithm changed. Mm -hmm. But I think they reward a lot more volume now. Oh well, that's I definitely yeah, you're right about that. And the way you make music isn't like that. You make a lot of your own sounds. 
you do everything from scratch. I mean, some people just use the same the same stuff over and over and the same sounds that are that are trendy right now, and then they'll upload five songs a week. And I think yeah. that YouTube which is nothing now, wrong with that. Like no, 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 absolutely not. You you find out yeah. what works. Definitely. But it fa- it favors them more now, which is fine. No, absolutely. I'm not I'm not bashing on them. I'm just thinking yeah. for the algorithm, it's more about that. I found that with me, one or two a week still keeps me doing well. It gives them enough time to soak in the last beat I put out, and then I don't get like a sensory overload of always uploading. But for some other people, like Cash Money, it works for them. Yeah, they got I, that style, yeah. and 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 they get the views too with that. But you just got to find out what works for you. So I, yeah. no, I I see what you're saying though. I know that's like a depressing sentiment overall, but I think I specifically mean all those comments about YouTube itself because mm-hmm. I still made six figures last year posting a beat like once every two weeks. Yeah. Like it's that's this is not to say that like you know the internet has let me down or I have failed the internet or whatever. Like it it still works, yeah. and I think with all the tools we have at hand, I think it's very possible to. To post a beat every week like I'm doing right now, get like two to three thousand views first day, if that, maybe not even, sometimes fifteen hundred or less, and still get five or six sales out, out of that first week. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's still such a viable daily living. Yeah. And then I Were think you, yeah. part of my motivation, part of my motivation for our sort of stepping into the industry is because I don't think I have the volume to like resuscitate my YouTube. So I might as well take that opportunity to try to step in with some with some bigger placements if I can make it happen. I, I think that's such an interesting stance because it's you're you're the guy that is kind of the inverse of all other producers. I, I, or, or maybe just the perception of producers. A lot of the stigma, because let's be honest, I, and I don't understand why. I mean, as you're saying, both of you made six figures off, off selling beats online. This is mm. a real career. I mean, this is there's, there's nothing fake, there's nothing corny about any of this. But there's still this stigma of internet producers as being these corny rip-off, you know, knockoff producers that are selling beats for five ninety nine, and yeah. and they're just doing that because they can't make it in the industry. You're the guy that made it on the internet, and you're like, eh, let me try the industry now. Um, mm. So tell tell me about that transition because because things are different. You have gotten some major placements, including Little Skies, which is is that yeah. project platinum right now? It's something. I don't know. Well, I don't know if you want to keep this in but uh he, they posted that it was gold like a few months ago like after it was like six weeks on the charts or 10 weeks on the charts and then like that announcement was just erased completely so i don't know if like it's not ria official or something like that but anyways you can search the database and you know if yeah it's... i did and 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 it wasn't up so i wasn't sure it wasn't up there so i'm not really sure about that but i guess from the beginning of my the history with my placements and the stuff that sort of got me thinking of taking a foot off the gas with YouTube and stuff, since it doesn't necessarily fit my artistic model anyway, was my Taiga placement, I guess, which was a whole story within itself. I don't know if you remember when that happened, Cody. This was I remember 100%. I tried to help you with that, but I didn't have no pull at that point. It was like 2016, and someone hit me up that uh, they saw on Snapchat that Taiga was bumping my beat diamonds which is like my 10th beat i ever wrote or something like that and it was this like slow uh like pretty cinematic i think i called it a future style beat it was like 2016 type future wave and they're like dude you're about to get they must they're gonna hit you up in a minute or something like that i saw it on a snapchat and then like i was like dope i didn't get too pumped because you know you, you are always skeptical and then two or three weeks later uh it comes out and it's called hundreds and it's a single with chief keef and everybody's like dude are you hyped and i was like no it's it's credited to this other producer it's it's like my exact melody you know and i write some weird stuff like there's no way that it you know in, they're in and a I'm, I'm not even saying exact in like some metaphorical sense it's like literally just you know you you cut and paste my my stuff and I was like, okay. So I sat down and was like, what are you going to do? Like, they took your entire beat and they slapped like a couple new kicks and they just redid the drum patterns essentially the same with the same swing with probably some different hi hat hits. But it's like, okay, what do I do? Like, I have no industry clout. Like, I don't have a lawyer yet. Uh, so 
I made a video, which is like the only recourse I had. Like the only audience I had was on YouTube. I think I had like 30 or 40,000 subs at that point, maybe, maybe less. I made a video with some humor in it, trying to be like, yo, Kylie or something like that. Like she's playing <laughs> on her Snapchat. Like that's, that's mine. Like you're, you're loving the wrong man. I don't know. It, it worked because it was obviously like, it was so obvious. Like, you know, you take something, you don't bother to flip it. You don't even bother to change the key or the tempo. Like what's wrong with you, dude? Like you're the worst thief in the world. Tyga hit me up after that thing went like ghost level viral, which is like 10 retweets or something. Tyga hit me up in the DMs and was just like, what's your email? And I was like, okay, fine. Like I made a dent in the situation. Sent me his email and I immediately called my dad back home and was like, do you know any like lawyers? And we're from Maine. So he was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, do you know anyone who does? So he actually like went through all his Facebook friends and saw if he had any like old high school friends that became lawyers. Cause thank God for Facebook. He found this one woman who he went to school with whose husband was now an entertainment lawyer and he couldn't take me on. So he asked for some suggestions. They gave me them within like an hour. I called one and was just like, will you help me? And I showed him the two files and he was like, oh, shit, like, of course, easy peasy. Oh, shit, I skipped a step. My bad. I got a call from Stephen Victor. That's the big one. I got a call from Stephen Victor, who had just become the SVP of a and at UMG and was Kanye and Tyga's manager at that point or something to that effect. And he was just like, what do you want? And I obviously had no idea what to say. I never made like any sort of deal, let alone talking to a major or this dude who is like such a big shot, you know? And so I tried to negotiate. I think I said like 1500 bucks and at least 25% publishing and whatever a standard royalty was. Cause I didn't really know how it was, how it was supposed to go back then. So I just kind of BS my way through it. He eventually agreed three, four, six weeks went down with no word. The song's been out. It's get, doing semi numbers, a couple, three, four million hits right in the first like couple weeks it's substantial it's got a full musical music video treatment it's got everything it's like a real single for tyga who had just broken up with kylie so he was like in the news or whatever and uh he was like all right if they've waited like over a month and not gotten back to you like i'm gonna call that verbal agreement moot and i was like sweet and he was like so you're down for me to like kind of go after them for some more and i was like yes like like please do uh they like wouldn't respond wouldn't respond forever and finally, my only option was to email Tyga, which like I had never wanted to do because that just seems like not the thing to do in the situation. And he responded within 30 seconds and gave me who to talk to and everything like that. It was the strangest thing. Like the only person in the entire scenario who was like kind of on top of his shit and like cordial and like ready to respond was the artist himself, which was like totally wild. So eventually he hooked it up with the proper lawyer and all that and we got it signed. And that was my first major placement. A few months later comes the, I get a text from Little Skies. That placement gets pushed through despite all the little, you know, some of, some money controversies with, with them trying to call it a mixtape in that classic scenario, which you've talked about a few times. I wasn't really too fussed about that because I knew it was going to be a big thing and I just wanted to be on there. So I got like an okay advance, maybe like half of what I would normally want. And then publishing and everything like that was perfectly fine. Um, they were able to sort out the sample easy peasy, just like all these big labels have plenty of resources to do so. That was no stress at all. For a moment there, they wanted to use the sample replay, and I was like, nah, like this sounds like Garbo. And it really did. And I'm super glad they were able to work around it, which, suffice to say, you can easily say no to something like that, and they will work around it. They have all the resources in the world. Well, yeah, the sample replay didn't help you in any way. But- that didn't get you any more no. publishing. Yeah, so who cares, right? No, it, it would not have. Uh, yeah, they would have just replaced... They would have just paid the sample <coughs> replay artists less than they would pay Silver Sun pickups in their publisher. So they were just trying to save money. Little Skies wouldn't have wanted it either. I think they were going a little bit behind him because this sounded like... It was It was great, you know, well played by the musician, but you just can't match this, like, old school quality. But anyways, I think I'm rushing through this one because I just wanted to say, like, both these big placements are, are going through... And I have great deals in theory in terms of publishing and just a standard royalty, like nothing insane. But, you know, a year later, nine months later, I've seen performance royalties, but I've seen nothing else other than my advances. No mechanicals. I've seen a little bit of money from 100, from hundreds by Taiga, a little bit of 
SoundCloud publishing for whatever reason, they use musicreports.com as their like Harry Fox agency for SoundCloud. And I've seen a tiny bit of money from that, but I've seen no other money from either of those, which probably racked together like 30 million, 40 million listens. So the crossroads I'm at right now, like long, long, long story short, is like, do I keep pursuing these placements, which in theory are very lucrative, especially when you know a record like Little Skies is now like 24 weeks on the top 200 Billboard. It's like number 37 or 39 right now. Like it's it's killing it. I think my track is like number five or six in terms of popularity on there. It's got like 20 million Spotify plays. So in theory, there's these very big lucrative arrangements, but if the dream money never comes like do you want to put both your feet in the industry or do you want to keep one on the internet where you know you're going to get like your daily wage so that's kind of where i'm at super duper long story short i'm not sure which which direction to take we've been talking about that a lot me and cody but yeah sort of my whole saga right there yeah i think we all have horror <laughs> stories about beats getting stolen and a lot of producers are apprehensive about Beats getting stolen, they're scared to death, and a lot of people don't understand that they do have recourse. Um, yeah. and, and you've you've actually dealt with that. I know before the interview started, you talked about a, a scenario in which you had a beat stolen, but you actually did something about it. And and maybe the outcome wasn't ideal, but you 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 effectively I shut that. It. You handled it, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> people who follow me on Twitter know what I've been dealing with. Something cool I think about starting out on YouTube. And building from there is a lot of people got your back that's seen you since day one growing. Totally. And and it's awesome to see that like there's a community of people that will support you if they feel like you presented good evidence. And same thing, the situation with uh, Mackenzie and the hundreds track, like I was behind him 100 percent. I was tweeting about it, retweeting a lot of people trying to help with that. They don't want to see any of us that would be smaller guys getting done over by the industry or anything like that but i really have like a no-nonsense approach when it came to dealing with these contracts because i know how they they try and play sometimes basically i had a contract sent to me a umg contract i won't go into details too much but if if you're on my twitter you've kind of seen a little bit what's going on they sent me the contract and i sent it back and i said i want this clarified as far as this is how i want to be credited on social media and i want to be credited in the title uh, when applicable, because I know in certain things like Spotify, you can only be credited in the metadata. And it was one of those situations where you live and learn. I probably should have been harped again when they sent the contract back and made it more specific. But they didn't want to give me credit. They wanted to use their their legal mumbo jumbo and uh, say it was an inadvertent mistake. We're fixing it in good faith. And I know how YouTube works. I, I have a hundred and, you know, however many thousand subscribers. I know how easy it is to fix the title of a video. They don't want to do it. Then they wanted to say that uh, my requests were were unlike any other producer's request <laughs> and that it was it was making it hard for them. I didn't make them sign the contract. So they, they want to do everything that they possibly could to not do it, even though they signed it. But at the end of the day... I look at it as black and white. You signed the contract. I sent it back with these terms, and you accepted them, period, point blank. I don't care what kind of runaround you try to do, what kind of filibustering you want to try and do. So then they wanted – I told them. I said, the video is going to be taken down by me for breach of contract, and once you fix it, I have no problem retracting the claim. It's fine. And – then they wanted to threaten me because it's universal and I was dealing um, with a South African agency, a creative agency, agency, I think it was. And they threatened me with impingement on their, them trying to fix the issue. They said they have at least 30 days to fix the issue. The issue was, and I stood my ground, and my, I think my biggest point is don't let these guys try to threaten you with this and that. Basically try to bully you. They wanted to threaten legal action against me, and they were going to look for uh, reparations and all the, the views they feel like and the money they feel like they missed out on because I got the video taken down. And I didn't let none of that play me because I knew what I signed. I knew my rights, and I stuck by my gut, and I don't let – you can't let these people try and scare you and use scare tactics to try and get over on you because you know you, you, it's in the contract black and white plain as day. 
So, so did the yeah. did the song eventually come back out and everything was good? No, um, this is I mean this is extremely recent. I'm talking like within yeah, the last it, yeah within the last week. Um, one of the other issues too, and I knew why I had a legal advantage there, is they were supposed to continue to credit me through any social media promotion of that track itself. I'm not asking anything unreasonable. If you're promoting that track, just drop my Twitter handle, produced by at VCXDY. It's nothing big. They actively kept not doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like, I'm talking to these people and they're like, we're fixing the problem right now. You need to give us some time. And then five minutes later, I'd see a social media post, blah, 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 track. Uh, had nothing and it had no mention of me. Then they wanted to credit me in the picture with a random made up name, CXDY H rounds, like a splice between my artist name and my full legal name. And I think a lot of the times with these industry things, they are so focused on their artist that they don't care too much about trying to cut corners with, with somebody like us. Or, or, you know, they're not going to do that with certain industry producers, but people like who aren't established in the industry yet they're going to see how much they can get away with and you can't let them do that you got to hold your ground especially as somebody who started out on their own as an independent like me and Mackenzie. you got to hold your ground on that yeah, and let's be clear i mean they're oh sorry pain but their their refusal to provide any sort of credit written or otherwise was over a period mm -hmm. of weeks yeah it was it was ongoing you know how much communication was there between you guys so much so you know the the terms inadvertent or anything like that are just so out of the out the window yeah at this point yeah. i don't know i think i think you handled that well i mean we were talking during yeah i, I talked think, to you the whole way through the hit yeah yeah you can't be bullied and you just gotta you just gotta stick to your guns and it does work out and i think but i think it, a lot of it comes down to building your supporters like the fact that we mm -hmm. have people ready to go to bat for us is like everything and that's only the internet can provide that you know yeah some unique there's yeah. some really unique that that you got to appreciate i want to respect your time um and and wrap this up by opening a huge can of conspiratorial worms and, and this is you know i didn't prepare for to ask this question or anything like that but the fact that there is so much pushback against what people consider internet producers which is a stupid term to begin with but because there's so much pushback against people who you know like yourselves, make a living selling beats to the general public online. Is that grounded in some kind of fear of the power that the internet actually gives producers? Because it seems as though you just, to put it frankly, don't give a damn about... And, and it, I had the same conversation with somebody like, uh, with Taylor King. I had the same conversation with Taylor King about this, where you're more willing and he's more willing to stand your ground because you're already making money on the internet. You already have a fan base on the internet. Mm -hmm. You're not afraid of this placement not going through because it's not mm -hmm. a matter of getting a check this month or not getting a check this month. So you're, you're going to push back on what you feel is an unfair deal way more than a producer who doesn't have a foundation on the internet. And do you think that there's some kind of conspiracy to diminish internet producers so that more people don't follow in, in your footsteps? More than not, I wouldn't say conspiracy. I think it's more just human nature. They don't like change. And the industry, the online producer industry, is something new. And they don't want to see the mold be broken. And, and like you said, it doesn't bother me. Hey, whether or not that the UMG deal went through, I'm still making five figures a month. It didn't matter to me. It doesn't hurt my living. And I think a lot of the times, it's still such a new thing with people making such a lucrative living by selling beats online that they still don't understand that we're professionals too, whether they want to admit it or not, because we're not signed to a label or we don't have a whole bunch of placements. We're still professionals. We're still making six figures in our field. Um, so I think that it's just human nature that they don't want to see it change. They like, they like the way it is because they know what to expect and they know how to play. But I mean, things change and you got to stand your ground, especially us as a community. Cause I think in a lot of ways we have a really good community that has each other's backs. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's so much easier to stand your ground. Like you're saying, once you have, 
once you have something to fall back on i mean nobody could ever take nobody could ever take the foundation we've built so it's like if i don't get this placement this beat is going to you know you cut the head off this this snake it's growing 10 new ones like you know if you say no we don't care like we're going this way and that way with it with all the confidence in the world and i mean it doesn't mean that we have limitless power in in uh negotiations or anything like that but like cody said it it wouldn't matter if we were just asking for an extra 0.01 percent the fact that we are so audacious as to ask for anything more in any part of the industry is just always is an act of war somehow so i think it's just unavoidable and uh but everything's changing i mean not not to be too dramatic about it but this is I'm sure there were always these avenues of change in the music industry as far back as it goes, right? And everything is so wild and new. But everything is everything is also so old and, and decrepit now. We're talking about you were talking about uh you know, the three to four percent producer royalty the other day. And like if we you know, we think about mechanical still being based on like actual physical mechanical productions like things like that we talk about like three to four percent producer royalty being based on like the old head version of a producer like your rick rubin or something like that these things just don't work for today and and that is really scary for you know the hip-hop baby boomers who are now no offense pain but like in their 30s and 40s like (laughs) wait a minute wait a minute what's the assumption here (laughs) no it's just you know yeah even though these guys aren't 65 but they're acting like they're 65 in the industry. You know what I mean? Like, they're. I act it's, like it's a 17 year old man, so I'm not offended. No, yeah, no, you definitely do. But you know <laughs> what I mean? It's. Um, so, so for true. people wanting to connect with you, producers wanting to connect with you, artists, um, recording artists wanting to get beats from you, what, what what are the best ways to reach out to check out your beats, check out your sound kits? Because I know Cody, you just dropped a sample kit. What are, what are the best ways? Yeah, um, you reach out to me. Uh, Type in CXDY on YouTube. I'll be the first person to pop up. You can subscribe. Uh, my Twitter and my Instagram handle is uh, at the CXDY. And my producer site where I got a team of producers that are producing sound kits and uh, drum kits and whatnot is thesoundcash.com. Yeah, mine's same thing on YouTube. If you just type in ghost. I'll be the, should be the first channel to pop up. G-H-X-S-T. All my handles are Ghost Ghost, just my name twice. And my website, where everything's at, drum kits, sound kits, all my beats is ghost.co. 